Hi, I'm Jen from Tea Leaves and Tweed, and here I talk about all things tea. So if that sounds like something you'd enjoy, be sure to subscribe to follow more of what I do. This morning, I'm looking at another historical tea video, and I was inspired by a gift from a friend. So this morning, we're looking at the history of Gyokuro, and we're having tea with, well, we're not really sure. So recently, my friend Tammy over at the Steeped Leaf shop decided that she just had to send me some of her beautiful Uji Gyokuro to try. And of course, I have featured a Gyokuro very early on on this channel, but it was not nearly as nice a Gyokuro as this. So I thought I just had to share it with you, and if I was going to share Gyokuro, I looked up the steeping method to remind myself, because I don't drink it very often, and I found that it actually had some pretty interesting history behind it, and in particular it had history that was more or less documented because it's a relatively recent tea. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about Gyokuro. I've talked about this before, but Gyokuro is a very fine quality of tea. It is shade grown, similar to the tea that is made into matcha, and because of that, it develops this beautiful umami quality, which is that savory quality that's also associated with things like hard cheese and mushrooms and soy sauce. And it's just this complex, delicate, beautiful cup of tea. And I've had a few over the years. This is one of the better ones I've tried, and it was just such a lovely, thoughtful gift from Tammy. So first, let's brew our first steeping of Gyokuro. So here we have our brewing setup. Gyokuro is brewed with a fairly large amount of tea leaf in a small amount of water. The water is quite cool and it's brewed for a slightly longer time than Sencha typically is. So here we have five grams of the Uji Gyokuro from the steeped leaf shop. And I'm going to put that in my favorite little fish teapot, which is the approximate shape of the traditional shibori dashi that a gyokuro would be brewed in. Sadly, I broke my shibori dashi recently. So I'm unable to use that right now. I'm still trying to decide how I want to repair it. So now I have water here that I've heated to about 150 degrees. Fahrenheit. And first, I'm going to pour it into the cup to cool off. And then I'll take this because the first steeping wants to be done quite cool between about 120 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So now you kind of Pour that over your tea leaves and you let it steep uncovered until the leaves kind of unfold a bit and you see them start to plump up. It usually takes about two to three minutes. So while we wait for our tea to steep, why don't I talk a little bit about the history of Gyokuro? So as I mentioned before, Gyokuro has a bit of a checkered past. There are several stories about its origin. They don't really conflict with one another, except in as much as each claims to be the first. And I have gone to my favorite reference on the history of Japanese tea, a bowl for a coin, which I will link below. The author writes that in 1834, Kamasaka Seichi plucked the finest new leaves and shoots from fields employing the roof over method of cultivation and then processed the product according to the process and procedure by a tea master. And the fine fragrance of this tea led to widespread praise. In the next year, 1835, Yamamoto Kihei produced a similar tea, and that is the most commonly accepted origin of Gyokuro, is Yamamoto Kihei VI's uh, processing in 1835. However, the actual story of that tea is that he was being taught to roll tensha leaves and messed up and ended up with these like circular bead-like leaves when he did the rolling process and called them, uh, I think, 
Pearl of Dew or Dew Pearl. And I think it's that name that tends to get associated with Gyokuro. Gyokuro means uh, Jade Dew. So finally, the story that I think has the most credence is in 1841, Sakamoto Tokichi uh, in Uji developed the process of creating a very fine tea that he named Jade Dew. And this is very likely where both the process and the name for Gyokuro came from. So with that, our leaves seem to have plumped up. So let's pour the tea. So as I mentioned the first time I steeped gyokuro, one of the idiosyncrasies is that you're supposed to be very careful as you pour it. And in particular, something I've learned is that you're supposed to use this gentle rocking motion to release the liquid from the leaves. And then as you pour, you want to make sure to shake out every last drop of tea. And as I said in my first Gyokuro video, the saying is that the whole universe is in that final drop of tea. So here I have my cup of the Jade Dew. It is a beautiful, brilliant, kind of yellowy jade color. I love this color. It just smells fresh and bright and green. I think that it, it really smells like you would imagine the color green should smell. Mm. Oh, it's got that powerful umami. But then it just melts into this kind of vegetable sweetness. I get uh, snap peas, which are my favorite vegetable, and buttered corn. It has this very kind of rich, almost buttery flavor. Mm. The texture is like a fresh spring vegetable soup, but pureed. It's so smooth. Mm. And of course, my neighbor has decided to chop down a tree, so I apologize for the background noise. Mm. It is that time of year. It's, this is not a cozy fall cup of tea, but it is a dreary morning, which it's not a dreary morning, but it is a morning's blurring into each other and I need a bit of a pick-me-up tea. So it is, it is of course becoming autumn, and in autumn the things start to dry out a bit. And you have to make sure and maintain all of your trees. So, the perils of living your other people. Mm. It's got a very, very, very mild, I don't even want to call it an astringency, but I think the word sourness sounds too negative. Supposedly that brightness, I'll call it a brightness, that brightness will come out more on the second steeping. And in fact, with Gyokuro, you're actually supposed to steep it a little bit hotter and a lot shorter for subsequent steepings. Even to the third steeping, uh, Yamamoto Yama Tea Company, which is one of the supposed originators of Gyokuro tea, suggests steeping your third steeping with boiling water for no more than 30 seconds. So I'm going to give this one more steeping to share with you. And then of course I would have to bring it inside to have fully boiling water. So I still have my water that's maybe about 150 degrees. I'm still going to steep it with the lid off because Japanese green teas in particular do not like to be overheated and the lid can somewhat stifle them a bit. Plus I get to look at these beautiful green leaves. And now that's been a little bit. You don't need to steep gyokuro for very long for the second steeping. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour it. And I 
I think that's every last drop. It's still that same beautiful jade color. It's hard to see because of the color of the cup, but it is just this beautiful green color. It smells brighter. Oh yes, you get that like little top note of tartness. I love that. And that, that really deep umami flavor, that like round, thick, rich depth from the first steeping isn't there anymore, but it's just this bright, slightly more refreshing cup of tea. This is very much a tea that I like to drink in the summertime. Oh, but of course I will drink it any time I get the chance, and if someone sends me a beautiful packet of Gyokuro, I'm not going to sit on it. So this has been two steepings of the Uji Gyokuro from the Steep Leaf Shop, along with a little bit about the history of Gyokuro. I hope you've enjoyed this historical tea session. As always, let me know if you have any requests for future historical sessions, or just say hi in the comments. I look forward to seeing all of you here again next time. Thank you for joining me. Bye.